Hey everybody, it's Scott Shetler from Extreme Performance Training Systems here in Atlanta. Welcome to this week's episode of Strength and Health TV. <clears throat> uh, in this week's episode, I want to recap a recent trip that I took up to uh, the Mecca of Strength, Westside Barbell. Uh, this was a great trip for me because I've been a huge fan of Louis Simmons and the methods that he uses to train power lifters and athletes uh, for many years now. I first was exposed to his material back in, I think, uh, around 2001 or 2002, somewhere around there. And uh, the more that I learned, the more I started to incorporate uh, various methods that he promoted into my training and that of the athletes and the lifters that I trained and saw nothing but great results uh, and great success. So <clears throat> this was great because I took one of the athletes that I'm training uh, for the Olympics next year up, up with me. And the main focus of the trip was to uh, look at his strength conditioning as we're gearing up for his Olympic trials in April. But I also wanted to, you know, take the opportunity to talk to Louie about uh, the methods that he uses, the methods that he promotes, and some of the things that I've done with my lifters and myself in training. And it was basically two days of just this massive amount of information being dumped on us and, uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of note-taking and lots of recapping, you know, once I got back to the hotel room. And you know, I can't say enough good things about Louie and, and the group up at Westside, everybody that was training there, uh, the people that work there, uh, Tom and, and Christy, everybody was just, just fantastic. Uh, it made us feel very welcome and uh, we're looking forward to going back. So thanks to Louie and everybody at Westside, this trip was absolutely amazing. So again, the main focus of the trip was to go up to work with uh, my athlete you know, on his strength and conditioning. But uh, just to uh, you know, back up a little bit for those of you watching this who aren't too familiar with uh, Louie or Westside Barbell, uh, I'll share a little bit of information, just general information, just so you get an idea of you know, what he is about as far as his basic training methods. Uh, Louie's been involved in the sport of powerlifting since I think the late 60s. And uh, over the years, uh, due to various injuries and you know, working with various lifters and things like that, he's developed a system. Uh, he started out with your typical uh, linear or western periodization uh, type of training and evolved into a system uh, that he developed uh, through many different, he's, he's learned from many different uh, old Soviet, translated Soviet uh, weightlifting manuals, talking with other sports scientists and coaches and through trial and error and experimentation, he developed a system in which he works all the special strength qualities in a weekly uh, microcycle, for lack of a better term. He's working on maximal effort strength, he's working on dynamic effort strength, and he's working on repetition effort uh, training using uh, those methods to build strength, to build power, to build speed strength, to build strength speed, and to develop muscle mass and, and help uh, prevent imbalances and bringing up weaknesses. And he does all that on a weekly training cycle. So he really has no off season uh, in his in his training philosophy, uh, you know his idea is that he's going to train at a high level all the time, and then all he's going to need is his taper going into uh, into a competition to prepare for the competition. So <clears throat> that's just a very generalized. That doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. Uh, if you're familiar with the method, basically. Uh, for, for the power lifters, uh, he sets up a weekly training schedule where you're training the lower body twice, uh, where you're having, you're having four main workouts a week, two lower body training sessions, two upper body training sessions. The lower body training sessions are focused on building the squat and the deadlift, and the upper body training sessions are focused on building the bench press because those are the three lifts that you compete in in powerlifting. Two of the days, uh, one for the lower, one for the upper, are dedicated to maximal effort training, uh, where you don't use the primary lift, you never perform a competition squat, deadlift, or bench press, but rather you perform a variation of those lifts. Uh, and he's got tons of variations of those lifts that he's experimented with and used. And uh, generally on the lower body day, you're going to work some form of squat, deadlift, or a good morning. On the upper body day, you're going to work some variation of the bench press. Uh, again, it's never the, the main lift. You're going to do a variation. You're going to max out on that variation. Again, this is a training max, excuse me, not a competition max because you're not doing these lifts in competition. So this is where auto regulation comes into play here. You're working at your uh, level of ability on that given day. Uh, the idea is, is that every time you circle back to one of the, the special exercises that you're trying to break your record in that, but you're just trying to max out for that day and then move on to the assistance work. So again, in the lower body, you're working some type of squat, 
uh, good morning or deadlift on the upper body, you're working some type of bench press. And some of the variations, you know, using special bars like the safety squat bar, the cambered squat bar, uh, using various types of bands and chains or reverse bands, using various uh, box squat heights, low box, high box, uh, using various heights of uh, deadlifts, either deadlifting in the rack, uh, out of the power rack off the pins at various heights, or deadlifting off blocks, or standing on blocks to increase the range of motion in the deadlift. You know, for the bench press, you could be doing uh, uh, reverse band presses, you could be doing various heights of board presses where you stack boards on your chest, you could be lying on the floor and doing a floor press, uh, you can work different angles of the bench press, incline, you know, flat, decline. Uh, there's so many, you know, various grip widths. The idea is, is that you're doing a different variation and you're keeping records at all those lifts. And over time, you're going to find uh, which lifts are good indicators for <clears throat> when your, your squat, your bench, and your deadlift go up. And uh, you're also going to find various exercises that help to build those lifts, that help to test those lifts. So it is a, a system that you have to implement. It's a system that you have to experiment with. And it's a system that you got to find the exercises that work best for you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of negative talk about the West Side Method online where everybody's an expert, uh, you know, saying that it doesn't work or that it only works for equipped lifters, you know, lifters that use squat suits and bench shirts or lifters that use steroids. And that's a bunch of crap because all the lifters that have worked out of my gym are all drug free. Uh, one of my best lifters, I can't even get him to use creatine. And uh, he's top 20, uh, top 20 to 25 all-time American records in the 114, 123 class in the bench press uh, in both weight classes and the total in the 114 class. So I've seen, and he's a very introverted type of lifter, so I've seen huge success both equipped and raw with him uh, and he's very drug-free. Like I said, I can't even get him to use creatine and barely protein powder. So he's, you know, a great example of what the system when you know built around his strengths and weaknesses has accomplished now those are the max effort days on the dynamic effort days you've got uh <clears throat> you're generally working the box squat where you're going to squat to a box that's set so that you're squatting below parallel uh, and you're going to work the bench press and uh, uh deadlift so with the dynamic effort day you're working at very set percentages uh louis a big fan of incorporating some form of accommodating resistance where you're either attaching bands or chains to the bar, and you're generally going to use about 25% of the load is going to be in some form of accommodating resistance, and then 50 to 60% of the load is going to be bar weight. So if you you know take your uh, take your competition squat, say your 400 pound squatter, you're 50% weak, you're going to use 200 pounds. Plus you're going to put an additional 25% in either chains or bands on the bar, and that's the weight that you're going to use for that day in the box squat. Uh, you're doing a very set number of uh, sets and reps to help control the volume. Uh, in the squat, generally, you're looking at about 8 to 12 sets of 2 reps. Uh, so you're averaging about 80 lifts, give or take, on a monthly basis, uh, between 50 and 60% plus accommodating resistance. So if you do the math, that's 75 to 85%, wherever you heard that before, uh, on the dynamic effort day. Uh, on the bench press, uh, it's a little bit different. You're generally going to work around 35 to 40 percent of your one repetition max, and then you're going to add that 25 percent in accommodating resistance. So your percentages might be. He's, he's seen over time that using a little bit lighter weight in the bench press has given him greater results. Uh, I've got a lifter right now who's using the 75 to 85 percent and doing pretty well with it. So you've got to experiment and find out what works best for you. But generally, your four weekly workouts are going to have two max effort days and two dynamic effort days. Now that's his. Programming for power lifters, I can say when I was at his gym, uh, there were certainly tons of power lifters in their training and they were doing their dynamic work on that Friday and that Saturday, uh, Saturday that we were in there. But the other athletes that were in there, uh, there was a professional football player, there was collegiate sprinters, there was a ton of MMA fighters, there were other lifters uh, you know, in their training uh, and everybody was doing something different. So don't think that just because what's become known as the West Side system, uh, that everybody just goes in and, and does that. Everybody's doing something different based on what their sport is, based on what they're training for. And Louis worked with so many different athletes of all kinds of different sports, record holders, medalists. Uh, just, just you know, do. A re I'm, I'm not here to, to talk about his credentials because I don't know all his credentials. But if you read his books, if you read his articles, if you <clears throat> research him online, you'll find everybody that he's worked with. He's very transparent about who he's worked with, the results that he's accomplished, because. 
the guy is just, he's on this quest for knowledge and to be the best. And uh, it, it was just amazing getting to talk to him for a couple of days. If you want a, a really nice uh, video to check out is one of the uh, West Side, former Westside lifters uh, and former uh, world record holders, uh, power lifters. AJ Roberts has a great video, it's about five or six minutes long, where he specifically outlines the uh, West Side method, the two max effort days, the two dynamic effort days, talks about the percents, the number of lifts and things like that. And Louie's got a ton of videos out there on, on YouTube you can find him talking about his methods. Uh, he's also got a lot of great videos that you can get in his, uh, in his store on his website too. Uh, they're great videos. Uh, they will give you great information about training. Can't recommend it enough. So getting back to uh, that, that's a little bit of an overview about the West Side method for powerlifting. And like I said, when athletes are in there, I see them doing at least a couple days I was in there, and what I've read, they're doing completely different things. Uh, it's pretty well known that top UFC fighter Matt Brown trains there for his strength and conditioning work. And I remember reading and talking to Lou even when I was there, he said that Matt hardly does any barbell lifts. I think he works a lot on the, the sumo deadlift. He works on, uh, I think, the zercher squat, and I think they do some various types of good morning lunges and things like that. So he's, he's doing very little uh, specific, you know, barbell powerless and stuff like that, but he's doing a tremendous amount of GPP and other special strengths exercises that Louis works with on the fighters. So again, nobody is training exactly the same in there, so you really can't say, you know, the West Side Method as, is this. What most people know is the West Side Method that the powerlifters use because that's what's been written about mostly through the articles and, and the, the books and the videos and such, but uh, the, the training methods, the, the machines, the training devices that he's got in there that we were able to take advantage of and learn from were just, just phenomenal. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about some of the things that we were exposed to for those two days in there. I'm also going to write a blog uh, where I talk about this stuff a little bit more in depth and I don't want to give it all away because uh, you know we did make this trip specifically for my athlete. Um, we did talk a lot about Lou, uh, a lot with Louie about training methods and some things like that. And you know, I just want to respect the information that he shared and the information you know that we learned and such. But I do want to share some of it because the stuff was great. One, it solidified that we're on the right track with a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Two, it opened up a bunch of new ideas, a bunch of outside the box thinking when it comes to preparation for uh, athletes. It was just just phenomenal. And uh, like I said, so much information was hurled at us. Uh, I'm going to try to decipher some of my notes here <laughs> uh, and uh, try to give you some, uh, some of the information that, that we learned. Uh, you know, real quick, you know, when it comes to training, uh, one of my favorite books, and Lou is a big fan of this book too, is The Science and Practice of Strength Training by Vladimir Zatsiorsky. Uh, this is the second edition of the book. And uh, just to make a, a basic statement, you know, and, and this is what I build a lot of the training of my athletes and the lifters that I work with on, and it's, it's the basis of what Louie works on too, is uh, Zatsiorsky states in his book, um, under Methods of Strength Training, if you got the second edition, it starts on page 80, but uh, this is real important here. He makes the statement that there are three ways to achieve maximum, maximal muscular tension. One, lifting a maximal load. Uh, exercising against maximal resistance, that is the maximal effort method. Two, lifting a non-maximal load to failure. During the final repetitions, the muscles develop the maximum force possible in a fatigued state. This is referred to as the repeated effort method. And then lifting or throwing a non-maximal load with the highest attainable speed. This is also known as the dynamic effort method. So Right there, Zatsiorsky talks in the Science and Practice of Strength Training about the three methods, the maximal effort method, the dynamic effort method, and the repeated effort method. And those are the core principles that Louis's weekly system is built on. Uh, so it's been verified in Zatsiorsky's work. It's been verified by his results as a powerlifting coach and a special strengths coach. And, uh, you know, he's produced a lot of exceptional results with athletes from all kinds of different sports. So that's the basis of the training uh, that I do with everybody I work with. Again, it doesn't always have to be the squat, bench, and deadlift. Those are just the exercises that powerlifters train. Uh, we do utilize a lot of types of squatting and pulling and pressing uh, with the athletes that I, I work with. But again, everything is built around the individual, their sport, their position within the sport, and then the sporting requirements. Um, so let's get into some of the, uh, the notes that uh, I, I took. This is still kind of a mess, so I apologize. I hate to sit here and read to you. Um, 
But some of the things that we talked about, sticking with the weekly plan, uh, my athlete's sport is swimming. There's really no off season, but there are periods of time throughout the, the, the year uh, where some competitions are going to be of greater importance when you're talking about things like nationals, when you're talking about things like worlds, you're talking about Pan Ams, and on the, uh, the quadrennial level, you're talking about the Olympic Games. So obviously there are events that are of greater importance, uh, and there's events that are of lower importance. So when it comes time to do a bigger event where more is on, on, you know, there's more at stake, uh, we're going to focus more on a, a taper into that competition so that he's at his optimal level of readiness. For smaller events that he just does throughout the year, we're not really going to taper. We might take the day off before so he can recover a little bit and he's going to go do the meet because the meet's not that important. He's not going to break a PR every time he swims. you got to pick and choose your battles in a sport that doesn't have an off season and for him it's going to be his bigger events and those are the ones that we're going to focus on more of a full taper going into. But we're going to stick with our weekly training plan where we're focused on building maximal strength, absolute power, speed, strength, strength, speed, and building up muscle where he needs it and working on general uh, physical preparation, you know, the conditioning of, of the energy systems required for his sport. So basically, we're sticking to a weekly training plan and then we're tapering into bigger events. And that's the general uh, framework that we're building this program around. So on a weekly basis, again, we're focused on building strength, speed, power, and conditioning. Uh, <clears throat> the, this is one of the big key things that I really took away that, that kind of you know, hit me. Uh, when it comes to conditioning, oftentimes you know, when we're talking about going out and pushing weighted implements, when we're carrying things, you know, when you're running and doing you know, whatever forms of, of, of aerobic or anaerobic conditioning that you're implementing based on the sport, one of the things that you know, I've always come across is just doing you know, various distances. Uh, without regard to time or maybe giving yourself a 10% drop off where if you're you know looking at speed uh, as long as you're hitting better than 90% of your, your best you know then we're going to keep going on, on the various repeats of the intervals but once you drop off below a certain point then we're going to terminate the workout. One of the things that he had us doing with the conditioning was doing more work in the same amount of time. So distance was secondary the, the main focus of the workout was going to be time, and, and this, this I absolutely loved. So what he had us do was go out with a sled, and he wanted body weight on the sled. Now, the, the variance in the resistance that you use on the sled is going to be based on the surface you're pulling. If you're pulling on turf, you're going to be able to load it up with a ton of weight because it's going, there's going to be less friction. You're going to be able to pull the sled more easily. If you're pulling on concrete or asphalt, depending on the finish or the quality of the surface, you might have to use less weight because there's going to be a greater amount of friction. So again, the load is going to be variable, but start somewhere around body weight. So for my athlete, that was going to be around 210 pounds, 215 pounds, because he does want you overcoming body weight on this. So basically what we did was we went outside, we attached the sled to a, a weightlifting belt, and my athlete was to pull the sled, not running, only walking, heel to toe, big strides, you know, utilizing the, the lower back, the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads, the calves, every, you know, part of the lower extremity to push off on each step. So we weren't going to be running. It was only going to be walking, uh, power walking. So for one minute, he pulled and we marked off the distance. Then we gave him a little rest period, and Louie told him, he said, now you're going to pull for another minute, but you're going to beat that distance. So now he's got a target from where he stopped to where he started. He's got to pull further than that distance on the second pull, and he's only going to be time for a minute. Well, that second pull, he beat the distance by about 20, 22 feet. So he did 20, 20, about 22 feet of work more than he did on the first set. Both minute long sets did more work the second time, so he pushed harder. He got, you know, he used more strength. He used more, more uh, uh, he, he got faster, he covered a greater distance. So again, rest period. Now, the next set was going to start at the original length plus that extra 20, 22 feet, for one minute he had to beat that distance. This third time he exceeded it by 40 feet. So the original distance plus the 20, 22 feet plus an additional 40 feet, so he added about 60, 62 feet over the course of three tips, all done in minute long sets. Each set he got faster, he did more work. So th this was absolutely brilliant to me and uh, this is one of the things that he's worked with a lot on sprinters and runners 
and uh, you know he said he typically sees somewhere between about four and six sets that they're able to keep breaking records before they eventually drop off and then you stop the workout you're done uh, so that every single time you pull you're breaking a record uh, <clears throat> this gets them away from doing the specific movement i.e. swimming i.e. sprinting and they're building up muscles uh, it's, it's, it is a form of strength, strength endurance training, but it's also doing a lot of work aerobically. Uh, and they're getting used to breaking records in a general exercise. So it's also programming the body for success. Uh, you're not always going to pull a sled. Sometimes, you know, you're going to throw a weight vest on, you're going to throw ankle weights on, you're going to throw ankle weights on your wrist, you're going to pull the sled with that additional weight, you're going to carry a safety squat bar, you're going to, uh, with various loads, you're going to throw a sandbag on your back while you pull the sled, you're going to hold a weighted medicine ball while you pull the sled that you need to use a lot of variety in the resistance on the body because you want to prevent accommodation. You don't want to do the same thing over and over and over because you're not going to get any stronger, you're not going to get any faster, eventually you're going to adapt to it and your, your progress is going to stop. So by changing where the resistance is attached to the body, by changing the amount of resistance, by changing the distances, sometimes we're going to be pulling for a minute, sometimes it's going to be 30 seconds, you know, there's, there's so many variables that you change, but the idea is, is that you're doing more work in the same amount of time and that you're providing, uh, you're, you're creating an environment to prevent accommodation, so you're changing the form of resistance. Uh, and it was just, it was absolutely brilliant. And I've been playing a lot with it for the last few weeks with the people that I train and we're seeing, already seeing great results. Uh, the, the clients love it, the athletes love it. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's been a huge, bonus to uh, to our training. So that was one of the things that just jumped out at me as being absolutely brilliant, but very simplistic. A couple of the special machines that Louis developed uh, that we got to use were his belt squat machine, his plyo swing, or his virtual force swing, and then a variety of his reverse hypers and his inverse curl machine, which was absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of the first things that he had Carl do was just get on the, or, or the athlete that I took up there do was get on the belt squat. We had about 180 to about 230 pounds of uh, weight on there, and then we also had a couple bands strapped around it, so he was getting a little bit of band resistance. One of the first things he had him do was five uh, one-minute sets of simply walking, pushing out side to side, not squatting, just walking. Uh, five one-minute sets with about one minute rest in between each, and what he found was that it started to activate his glutes, his hamstrings, his hips tremendously. After that, we went into uh, some various other exercises in the belt squat, types of reactive jumping, uh, various types of squatting. They'll do timed box squats where you might do a minute set, you might do a 30-second set, and you're just doing as many reps as you can in that time. And the idea being that you're trying to in increase the amount of work uh, or the amount of resistance that you're doing for a given time. So the belt squat turned out to be a very versatile machine. And just in some of the ways that he implements it with his MMA fighters and things like that, it's it's a really great machine. Some of the benefits, some of the physical benefits, if you've got a back injury, uh, you can squat because the belt attaches around your hips and it's pulling down the resistance, is pulling down, so it's actually tractioning the back a little bit. And he's seen it help reset people's hips. Uh, and definitely, there's no spinal compression, so it's a great way to squat without loading the spine. So it's a fantastic machine. Uh, the virtual force swing or the plyo swing was awesome. It's basically a chair that's suspended from a, a rail overhead. You got a big platform that you start with your feet on and you can attach resistance. You can use this body weight uh, with no resistance on the machine. You can also stack weight plates on there and there's also attachments for resistance bands. So the idea is, is that you're pushing off the platform and then you're landing back on the platform. So it's a, it's a type of jump uh, exercise. Uh, except you're, you're sitting in a machine and pushing off a, a platform versus just jumping off the ground and you can control the amount of resistance that you use via free weights and bands. So we worked on that a little bit and one of the things that he mentioned was on these power development exercises on various jumps on if you're going to do true plyometrics and shock training methods and things like that to uh, not develop a bilateral deficit even though he is uh, taking off the blocks in, in his event, swimming with one foot forward, so you're putting a little bit more pressure on the front leg, not to train like that, to train both legs evenly, because strength training is general physical preparation for athletes. So uh, most of the work that we did was with the feet in a balanced position. That doesn't mean you shouldn't train one legged at times, uh, or if you're going to use a scissor stance or a split stance on various exercises, make sure that you're training both sides uh, evenly. So the plyo swing, the virtual force swing was awesome. Uh, the inverse curl, 
is kind of a progression on the glute ham raise, which is right here behind me. Uh, the inverse curl is a machine that Louis developed. It's basically, if you're familiar with something called the poor man's glute ham, it's basically where you kneel down, somebody holds your feet, and you lower yourself with your hamstrings down to the ground, and then you raise yourself back up. It's a very difficult exercise. I've never seen anybody do it keeping strict body mechanics. Usually the, the butt shoots back, or they need to push off the ground with their hands. So while the inverse curl is basically a pad that you can kneel on, it's got a, a foot plate in the back similar to the glute ham benches, and then it's got a big long arm that sticks up with a pad that you can put across your chest and you can load it up with resistance so that you're actually getting assistance. So it's deloading your body so you can perform the exercise correctly. I did a little bit of a deadlift workout with Louie on uh, the Saturday that we were there and I hit the inverse curl after my deadlifts for about three sets of five. I forgot how much weight I had to put on the machine, maybe like uh, 75 pounds or something like that or 100 pounds, so somewhere around there's a few, few small plates and uh, I can only manage three sets of five and my hamstrings were toast for a couple of days afterwards. So it's a great, great device, great machine and that's something that I'm gonna definitely be adding to my lineup here. And then he had a variety of reverse hypers. I've got his Ultra Pro reverse hyper here uh, where we use it with the uh, various straps and the roller pendulum attachment. He's got so many different reverse hypers. Uh, in there, he's got one that's got a big arc below it. It's kind of a leverage reverse hyper and the, the table angle changes, so you, it, it's definitely more for affecting the lower back. One of the ones that we found really interesting is called his dual pendulum reverse hyper that he put my athlete on. Uh, it's got two pendulums, so your feet can work uh, independently of each other, so you can, you can perform reverse hypers in more of a scissor action. Uh, which is great for people who have to run, sprint, you know, athletes who, who uh, uh, want to work their legs in independently. You could also work one leg at a time if you want. So it just provides a little bit more option for uh, how you perform the reverse hyper exercise. Really cool machine. Um, and of course, he had his uh, regular reverse hypers in there too with the straps and the, the roller pendulums and such. So we took advantage of all that and played with those. Uh, and got to do a lot of great work on that. Various hack squat machine jumps where you're attaching bands and weight, and you're attaching weight to the, to the bar, but you're attaching bands over the top, so you're pushing against resistance, but then you're also putting bands along the bottom so that it's pulling you down harder and creating more force on the impact. Uh, and that was just a simple hack squat machine. Uh, he was a big fan of doing a lot of calf work, uh, front of the leg work, back of the leg work, doing a lot of footwork and things like that to strengthen up the muscles around the ankle. Felt that was something that was very overlooked in the development of athletes. And uh, <clears throat> I talked about the sled dragon. He's also a big fan of loading up a safety squat bar. Uh, he said yeah, the distance around his warehouse is somewhere about 440 meter or 440 yards, so it's about a quarter mile track. Uh, he said it's a great conditioning exercise, so the very last thing Carl did when we were there. He loads up the safety squat bar with about 135, takes it out of the rack, and Louis shouts from across the gym. He said, throw another, he said, throw some quarters on there. I want you to effing remember me. So it was just kind of classic. Uh, and we took it out. Uh, my athlete walked it for the entire distance around the building, and it just, it trashed him. It, it was unbelievable the effect that it had on him. Uh, not just the stabilizing and support muscles in the torso, uh, but it was a great, great effect on the cardiovascular system as well. So uh, that was pretty innovative use of the safety squat bar. Another thing that he's a big fan of are wheelbarrows and uh, top UFC fighter Matt Brown, who trains there, developed an awesome device. It's called the War Wagon uh, Weighted Wheelbarrow. And it's basically a big triangular piece with the wheel at the front, some handles, and then various pegs that you can attach uh, resistance to. And I think we used it with uh, two, three, four, five, about six... 45-pound uh, plates on it, so it was somewhere about 270 pounds, and you walk it with the uh, the weight out in front of you, or you can turn around and walk it like a rickshaw and drag it behind you, but that provides a lot of opportunity for various types of conditioning and general preparation. And uh, like I said, he's a big fan of uh, ankle weights, wrist weights, and uh, weighted vests, and using that when you're doing your general physical preparation. Um, one of the things that I found uh, absolutely amazing uh, he said that he likes to go back to the gym when nobody else is there and train on his own and do some things. He does a lot of GPP work. Uh, he's got to do it just to stay healthy. He's had a lot of surgeries, a lot of injuries. You know, his knees are, are really bad, and, and he was telling me that he does somewhere between two and 300 sets of, or two and 300 reps of leg curls uh, with 20, 10 to 20 pound ankle weights every day. And that if he doesn't do them, he has a hard time even walking up his steps. Uh, so he does that just for, uh, for knee health, for uh, uh, strengthening the hamstrings. He loves the high rep work for strengthening the tendons and the ligaments. Uh, he, one of the things he wanted us to do was a lot higher reps on the reverse hyper, uh, maybe using lighter weight, but doing reps upwards of 30 reps per set. 
Um, again, uh, just a ton of different uh, methods and, and, and uh, ways to utilize the equipment, different uh, set and rep protocols, different you know lengths of time. He's big into time sets, timing various exercises and stuff like that. Again, basically what you're doing is you're learning how to train yourself. You're building your training, you're taking these principles and you're applying it to you as an athlete, you as a lifter, finding your strengths and weaknesses, uh, shoring up your strengths, building your weaknesses, making sure that you don't have any any holes in your preparation. It's absolutely brilliant stuff, but it's also very, very uh, simple stuff. So I think that kind of covers, uh, I talked a lot about contrast training. Uh, one of the things that we're going to experiment with is, is going to the pool and doing some starts right after, uh, right after weightlifting. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, that my athletes trying to prove on is his reaction time and a start. So a lot of the stuff we did was focused on lower body, uh, speed, strength, strength, speed, absolute power, uh, jumps, you know, various weighted dynamic exercises and maximal strength stuff. Um, so contrast training talked a little bit about and just to make sure that I covered everything. Um, yeah, that, that was really, uh, that, that's really kind of a, uh, kind of a good overview of the stuff that, that we were exposed to. Again, it gets a lot in a lot more depth than that, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what we were able to pick up on a couple, uh, a couple days there. We're definitely planning on going back again. I can't say enough good stuff about the, the, the lifters, the people that work there, the environment was unbelievable. You know, they always talk about, you know, West side and, and the atmosphere and stuff like that. When the lifters are in their training and one of them is going for a heavy lift or maybe a record lift or, or, or something, everybody stops and they are all around that lifter yelling, you know, trying to, to, to be there to vocally, you know, to verbally support them, to coach them, to, to encourage them to make that lift. It's, it's definitely, even though everybody's in there trying to be the absolute best they can be, it's also a uh, supportive team environment and, and they're there to push each other to get better. And, and uh, it's, you know, that, that, that type of training atmosphere is very, very valuable. I remember when I was doing a little bit of deadlift work with Louie, you know, he was working me up a little bit and these huge lifters all come over and they're, they're screaming at me uh, to get my, my tiny little weight off the ground. So it, it's, it's, you know, they, they know that everybody's in there trying to do their best and uh, the environment was unbelievable. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go, to go learn from Louie, to go, to go train there, to uh, just, just, you know, get some of the information that he's willing to provide, it's definitely worth, definitely worth the time. Start by reading every, he's, he's put out so much free material online, he's got so many books. Uh, one, he actually gave me a copy of his new book. This is uh, Special Strengths Development for All Sports. This book is amazing. It's, it's about 390 pages long, and uh, a lot of what they do is in here. <clears throat> I'll just give you an overview of the table of contents. I've, I've gotten into it a little bit. I haven't gotten through the whole book yet because I've only had it for a couple of weeks. But he starts out by talking about the conjugate system and <clears throat> the method that he's you know, developed into what you would consider the West Side Method, uh, the role of strength in sports, <clears throat> endurance, another final note on the conjugate system, contrast and reactive method. Uh, so this would be you know, utilizing various types of accommodating resistance, weight releasers and such, periodization, division into training periods, general physical preparedness. Uh, he's big on GPP and just being generally fit. Olympic lifting is actually covered in here. Training for combat of sports and arts, which is, uh, I, I jumped ahead to that section. It's phenomenal, phenomenal information. Uh, Sports nutrition and hydration, restoration and recovery methods, age and long-term planning. And again, it's about 387 pages long. Uh, it's an amazing book just on what I've seen so far, and he was kind enough to give it to me. Again, I can't thank him enough for the information that he shared and, and uh, everything that we learned. So again, this is a fantastic trip for me because it, one, it showed us that we were on the right track with a lot of what we were doing. Two, it exposed us to so many different methods, so many different ways of thinking, so many different ways of approaching training, and just about building your plan. And uh, again, I, I just uh, was totally blown away. I, I feel like there's so much more to learn. I can't wait to get back up there and, and continue to learn from them uh, and just absorb all this information that we came back with. So hopefully uh, you found this this video interesting. Hopefully uh, it, it helped open, uh, you know, open your mind to, to looking at some of the things that he does and learning more about the system and the training methods that he develops and promotes. And as a bonus this week, since I uh, 
did go up there and get, get a little bit of information for myself. Uh, I'm going to do a separate video on a special exercise that he showed me, which I feel is an absolutely brilliant assistance exercise for the deadlift. So I'm going to film that in a separate video, and we're going to post that in the blog this week uh, as a bonus video. Uh, again, hope you enjoyed the information that I presented. Thanks a lot for checking it out, and until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.